Hello. Um, uh, welcome, everyone, to this uh, third lecture. It's part of the British Council and ISER Pune's um, effort to bring historians of science from the UK. Um, and this is the third lecture that we're hosting here at NCBS as part of a series. Uh, so today, Dr. Charlotte Slay is here to talk to us about the history of science in Europe and um, the Science and Society program here at NCBS uh, is interested in looking at the role of science in society and of course understanding history is a significant part of that endeavor. I'd like to invite uh, Leighton from the British Council to introduce Dr. Slay to today's lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you of course to NCBS for hosting um, and, and to Isapuna. Uh, for joining with us in bringing these lectures. It is the fourth in the series to come to Bangalore, the third to N um, NCBS. It is part of our internationalizing higher education program. It's one of the few things that we do, such as faculty exchange, um, student exchange programs, um, and getting more or back into this space of sort of public engagement around um, academic subjects. And in this particular series, science is something that we wish to do more on. So there will actually be some forms that will travel around the room at some point. I would ask that you do fill them out. Um, give us your feedback, obviously, on the lecture. Also, ideas in which we can work with institutions like NCBS um, and academics, such as Charlotte, to to bring you know sort of that greater public awareness and engagement. This particular series has had a engagement between institutions, so speaking very much to fellow academicians and future academicians. Um, and I think we hope over time to use that engagement to also start reaching out to other people outside of the academy. So it'd be great to get your, your thoughts on that. Uh, Charlotte Slay is a lecturer in the School of History at the University of Can Canterbury, uh, studied uh, the history and philosophy of science in the University of Cambridge. Uh, so uh, uh, a perfect background for what you'll hear today. Uh, she, um, her teaching includes science and literature, Victorian science and society, the history of animals and the history of the body in the 20th century. So it's very much a social understanding of science, that sort of wider context of science. Uh, as a coordinator of a degree of MSc um, in science communication and society, which I think is almost perfect for actually the spirit of the talks that we have today. And uh, Charlotte has included in her biography, and I don't know if we're right to continue this known as, um, but Charlotte is often known as the ant woman for her research into not only the study of ants, but also how social perceptions have shaped that particular understanding and study of ants. So I suppose you can look at many different specialisms within science and tell an incredibly surprising and interesting and diverse story. And I'm sure we'll hear another one today. Um, yesterday, we, we had a sort of tour through uh, the, the public communication of science um, and particularly how ele electricity was used to light up the 19th century and 18th century audience. And today, of course, we'll be looking at the marvels of microscopes. So thank you very much, Shadow. Thank you for joining us in India. And over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Is it possible to, to turn this front row of lights off so we get a better uh, view of the screen? Can we do that? There's, a, there's some nice pictures coming, and it'll be good to... That's great. Is that okay still? Good. Okay. Thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak at such a prestigious institution as NCBS. And I'd also like to publicly thank the British Council um, and Isapuni for the work they've done in putting this whole tour together. It's been um, such a privilege to travel around India um, encountering scientists in action um, to hear about the research that's going on um, and how that fits in with the vision of this great nation and uh, its future. I'm here today to take you far, far back in time. We're going to do a whistle-stop tour, about 200 years worth of history, starting in about 1450 and going on for another 200 or 250 years after that. And it's the period that the history textbooks refer to as the period in which modern science was born in Europe, a period sometimes known as the scientific revolution. It's also the period that more general historians refer to as the early modern period. And it's the period in which there were many marvels and great use 
of microscopes. We're going to encounter a few themes in today's talk. We're going to look at the birth of humanism, a new style of scholarship that arose in Europe at the beginning of the period that went on to shape not only the humanities, as the name suggests, but also science. And it's interesting, I think, to see how those two had a common root. We're going to look at the processes of exploration. Exploration is perhaps a generous word for the cultural encounters that occurred during this period and the, um, the inequalities of power that were contained within those. We might talk about trade, we might talk about piracy, or perhaps much worse, but those encounters with the new world. We're going to look at instruments that already existed, but how they were reused to make a new kind of knowledge. We're going to look at changing ideas of metaphysics, that's to say, ideas of what kind of things there are in nature. And finally, we're going to look at the birth of scientific institutions. Scientific institutions, both physical and human, that connect with the very type of building we're in today, but also some of the slightly more intangible ones, like the birth of the scientific journal. Let's start with a map of Europe. It's worth remembering, this is towards the end of the period that we're talking about, it's worth remembering that Europe during the early modern period didn't have the nation states that we're familiar with today. It was broken into many, many smaller states. Great Britain was divided into England, Scotland and Ireland. So no British council then, the English council at best. And enormous complexities in the middle here. Um, and Italy, which is going to be important to our story, was in fact many different states. Venice is going to be important to our story. Just look at Venice here, just notice how it's made up entirely of coastline. That's going to be important to our story. And the story that I'm going to tell is really going to start in the south of Europe, which is where the birth of humanism really occurred in many ways. By the end of the story, we're going to wound up in the northern half of Europe, in England and the Dutch Republic, where the main gravitational center of the scientific revolution had moved. So let's start in 1453. It's a nice, convenient start point for our story. 1453, as this picture shows, was the year in which Constantinople fell, was taken from the Arabs. And there was an important cultural result of this event. Ancient texts, ancient Greek texts that had largely been lost from European culture, had been kept, had been treasured, had been translated, had been studied in Arabic cultures, and was now released, thanks to this victory, to come back into Europe. And as those ancient texts traveled back into Europe, they fed into a new style of scholarship that was emerging, a scholarship that today we know as the humanities. And there were two main strands to the humanities, I think. The first was a search for authenticity, a belief that the further back you could go, the earlier the manuscript you could find, the more likely it was to be authentic, the more likely it was to be a good account of many areas of philosophy, but most particularly for our story, for the area of philosophy that was known as natural philosophy, what today we call science. And in a moment, I'm going to introduce you to three of the main classical authors who inspired early humanist scholarship in natural philosophy, Aristotle, Plato, and Ptolemy. So the earlier, the better. The earlier, the more trustworthy, the more authentic. But then there was a second element of humanism that was in tension with that. And that second element was the strand, the practice of criticism. The idea that you could argue with a text, that you could mount an argument and test it out, that you could have two opposing opinions on a text and you could argue it out between you, that you could have a statement that was provisionally true, 
Before then, there had been no sense of provisional truth. Something was either true it was, or it was not. But now there was a sense of, well, maybe. Let's test it. Let's see. Let's argue about it and see. And those arguments were conducted in a triangulation between the people who were participating and those ancient texts. There was no sense of looking to nature. It was looking to the texts and arguing between yourselves and with the texts. So that's humanism, the common root of all contemporary modes of scholarship worth their name. Some names you might have heard of, the great humanists Erasmus, and in England, Thomas More, who I'm particularly fond of because he is a local to Canterbury, or at least he is now, or at least he is partially, by which I mean just his head. He fell foul of King Henry VIII, but that's another story. His head is buried in the church that is 200 meters from where I live. So let's have a little look at the philosophy of Aristotle that came to be so important, it had been important to a certain extent, or very largely through the medieval period, but now it was coming into question in some interesting ways. And I always find it fascinating to examine Aristotelian philosophy and I always enjoy presenting it because it's such a different way of thinking about the world than what we have today. Aristotelian philosophy of nature relies really on the number four, of patterns of four. And it starts with the simple properties of the world, the elements. So today we have, how many elements do we have? Pop quiz time. How many? 180? Yeah? 118? Okay, no one's, no one's denying that. We'll go with that, <laughs> we'll go with that answer. Uh, but for Aristotle, there were only four. And they had four qualities, hotness, dryness, wetness, and coldness. And those mapped on to the four elements, fire, which was hot and dry, earth, which was dry and cold, water, wet and cold, air, hot and wet. And those things had a physical place in the universe. The starry realm up top, that's where the fire was. So when you light a match or light a fire, the flames go up. Why do they go up? A surprisingly difficult question to answer. I had a long argument about that with a friend the other day. But for Aristotle, it was easy. The flames go up because they want to get to the fiery realm, which is the top layer of the universe where the stars are. And then there's air, and then there's water, and then there's earth. And moreover, these four elements with their four qualities also mapped on to the human body. So there were four constituent elements to the human body, according to Aristotle. Blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And depending on which one of those characteristics predominated in you, that determined your personality. And we still have echoes of those in our language today. So you may know the word sanguine comes from the, the French song for blood. A person who is sanguine is very happy-go-lucky. Um, it's it, it's a, perhaps the best quality to have, I think. If, you have, if you're dominated by your phlegm, you are phlegmatic, kind of a little bit stodgy, um, kind of philosophical. I think that's the best quality to have in traffic, probably that one. If you have black bile, that's also known as melancholic. You are sad, you're prone to depression. If you have more yellow bile than anything else, then you are a bilious person, a bit bad-tempered, a bit crotchety. And there was a whole system of medicine based around these qualities. A doctor would diagnose you as being out of balance in respect to one of these. And he would attempt to set it right. And the thing was, those qualities also mapped onto the stars. Because if you know anything about horoscopes, you know there are fire signs, earth signs, air signs and water signs. So there was a connection between your body and the stars set in the sky. 
which, which, uh, which star sign you were born under might affect your physiology. And your medical treatment would be determined both by your characteristics and what was a propitious time to be treated. So it was an incredibly intricate system of philosophy that bound together what today we would call physics, medicine, and astronomy. And as I'm sure you know, the ancient system for understanding the heavenly bodies was something like this. The Earth was in the middle with then the moon, certain planets, and the stars, uh, and the sun going around it, and then this outer shell, which was the immovable stars, the celestial sphere. So the Earth, was the element of Earth, was at the center of the universe. And in the whole of this sphere, uh, the whole of this um, sphere contained within the moon's orbit, that was where physics applied. That was where change could be observed in the universe. But beyond the lunar sphere, you got into the unchanging heavens where everything was perfect. Nothing was pockmarked. Nothing ever changed. It was beautiful. And by the time the Christian church had put their gloss onto Aristotle, that had a heavy theological component to it. Now, I promised I'd also talk about Plato. Plato's system of philosophy was a little bit different to Aristotle's. Plato based a good deal of his philosophy on the notion of perfection. Things in the world were imperfect, but there was a perfect version of them somewhere out there. And geometrical forms were a good way a good, of thinking about perfection. They were a good example of perfection. So what we have here is a model, a, f a physical model. Well, we don't quite know, I think, whether this was a physical model or just a drawing of a physical model, constructed by the great astronomer um, Kepler from his Mysterium Cosmographicum. And Kepler calculated that the orbits of the planets and the various heavenly bodies around the Earth were such that you could fit within them, you could nest within them, the various perfect geometric solids. And so that was a way for Kepler of making sense of the universe. Finally, I just wanted to talk about Ptolemy, who was a first century, a, a common era um, Hellenic philosopher. And one of the things that he was well known for was his geography. Now this isn't, we don't have an original map by Ptolemy, but this is a 15th century reconstruction. So this is a pretty old reconstruction of that map. And just in case you're struggling to orientate yourself, you are here. Well, or, or maybe not. There seems to be a bit of a, how far up are we? There seems to be a bit of a bite mark taken out of Indy there. So we're, you are somewhere here-ish. Now, so there was this great, all these great ancient philosophers. They, they were coming. They'd come from the East. They were being intensively discussed. They were searching for authenticity in these texts. They were searching for the earliest and best versions of them, but they were also arguing about them and arguing about their validity. And as time went on and voyages set out from Europe to far-flung parts of the world, there was an increasing sense that maybe, maybe these philosophers, these ancient philosophers, were not quite so reliable or so perfect as had previously been believed. And this is somebody talking in 1543. Ptolemy in his geography extends habitable lands as far as the equator. The moderns have added China, islands, and especially America. We would not be surprised if Ptolemy were wrong. And this is a big and daring statement to make. This is not, let's argue with it, and perhaps we, can, perhaps we haven't quite understood the text. Let's go back. Let's find better what the true answer is. This is the sense that maybe these guys have got it completely wrong. Maybe we need to start again. <laughs> 
And so, so you recognize the date there, 1543, right? You know, that's, uh, that's, what am I saying? Ignore that. So uh, this, is the, this is the period in which voyages are starting to go out around the world to these places that that commentator mentioned and bringing back the most extraordinary riches from around the world. But not just riches, also things that are worthy of philosophical discussion. So here we have the conquest of Mexico by the Spaniards. And we know that the Spaniards took enormous quantities of silver, for example, from Mexico. They got a great deal of wealth. But it wasn't just metals. It was also new things, new spices that came from new plants that had never been heard about, for example. And here we have uh, a rather lovely drawing, map, whatever you would call it, of the Jardin du Roi in Paris. That means Garden of the King. So the king in France, in a sense, owns the world in miniature. All of these new and wonderful plants that have been brought back from places where French explorers, traders, pirates have gone, have come back to the king, and he's making a claim about how he owns the properties of the world. And people started to make experiments and tests. What was the medicinal value, for example, of these plants? Could they be cultivated in European countries? Also, animal specimens were brought back by the same voyages and were traded for enorm enormous sums of money. Even pictures of the animals were traded for enormous sums of money. And very, very wealthy people, mostly aristocrats at the beginning of our period, princes, kings, would collect these creatures and display them in great displays for people to come and visit. Now, if you have a lot of anything, if you collect anything, eventually you hit upon the problem of how are you going to order it? You've got all this stuff. You have to decide how, what, what are you going to put at the top? What are you going to surround it with? What's going to be at the bottom? You have to impose some kind of taxonomy upon it. Now, if you have a ginormous crocodile, obviously that's got to go at the top as the coolest thing. But in a very physical way, this throws up the question of what goes with what in nature? What are the natural groupings in nature? And people went back to Aristotle to try and find the answer to that question. Even though these were new things that were not described in Aristotle, they hoped that by reading Aristotle, they would get some kind of a framework that they could slot this new stuff into. It would vindicate Aristotle, even though he hadn't seen these particular examples. It was a difficult thing to do because Aristotle didn't really pay attention to taxonomy. He'd faced the same problem in as much as he'd written a book about natural history. And when you write anything, you have to decide what you put first, what you put next, what you put after that. But it hadn't really been his priority. But nevertheless, they were still trying to make sense of Aristotle through it. Sailors uh, are canny folk. And sailors pretty quickly cottoned on to the fact that these princes were prepared to pay large amounts of money for remarkable specimens. And so I think sometimes sailors and sometimes the inhabitants of these countries that they were going to made some pretty marvelous marvels to be taken back home and included in these specimens. Here is uh, a mermaid from the Horniman Museum just outside London. It's pretty scary, isn't it? Mermaids are supposed to be beautiful. Uh, and here is a picture of a manfish about the size of a boy seen at Rome. And that's included in a book of animals from 1604. Here's another image of some of these items on display 
for people to look at. I was just as I was coming up, I was admiring the architecture of your wonderful building, but I think we would admire the architecture of this one too if we were standing in it. It speaks to the huge amounts of wealth that was being generated by these raids on, on countries around the world and the, the, the grabbing of the natural resources that was present in those lands. You'll notice in this picture that there are some ladies walking around. There is no obvious king as such. There is a sense that perhaps some, uh, perhaps a wider section, selection of the public is beginning to participate in the discussion about these physical objects of nature, not about books, but the physical objects of nature, the categories, the taxonomy that they sit within, and their meaning. And here's where we start to move, as time ticks along, to the north of Europe, to the Dutch Republic. Here is a canal in Amsterdam. And in the period, the, gold, the golden age of the Dutch Republic, much wealth was coming to the Dutch Republic from uh, South America and many other places. And there was enormous wealth in merchandise, they were buying and selling at the dock. People were going and they were buying as much as they could afford of the specimens that were coming in. And a wealthy middle class was emerging. Lawyers and most particularly doctors. Because doctors was about as close as you could get to a profession that had to do with natural philosophy in those days. So these doctors were, collect were, were studying diseases and the human body, and they were naturally interested in that kind of thing, but they were also collecting other items from nature in as much as they could afford them. And this beautiful cabinet here was a cabinet for collecting insects. So you might not necessarily be able to afford a vast room to put your collection in, but you could probably buy a really beautiful piece of furniture if you were a doctor and store your collection in that. And you could be discussing with your friends what is the meaning of these creatures? How do they work? How can we understand these things? And what taxonomy should we put them into? This is a book by Carl Linnaeus. It's called Materia Medica. Materia Medica means the material of medicine. The plants, the herbs, the things that were known to have effect on the human body. And I, excuse me, I like this picture because it reminds us of that insect cabinet that we've just seen. You can see, I think, the cultural relation between medicine and natural philosophy in this picture. You have to decide what you're going to put and where. And in many collections of the, the more wealthy collectors, you would see Materia Medica and items, other items of nature all alongside one another. And so we proceed from the physical ordering of specimens to a theorized, to a word-based ordering of specimens. Not the things in themselves, but the verbal representations of them. So this is also by Linnaeus, a little later. And this is his first stab at creating a system of nature. A system of nature. And this is everything in the animal kingdom on the single double page spread. Pretty good going, huh? By the time he got to the 10th edition, I think he was up to about 2,000 pages for the same thing. And not only that, but this whole middle column here was devoted to the, the so-called paradoxa, the paradoxical creatures of nature. Things like that fish boy, things like that mermaid, there was still a sense that those somehow fitted into this system of nature. I think by about the fourth edition, he'd got rid of them. But even there, there was a sense that uh, maybe the way to figure out for sure whether these were real or not was not to read Aristotle, but was to go and look. Because if you read this column, it's almost an invitation for you to go and do a bit of sleuthing of your own. So he will say, for example, the uh, monk-headed fish has, is supposedly in existence in Berlin at such and such an address. So if you bought this book, 
and you live near Berlin, maybe you could go and check it out for yourself. Okay, we're going to rewind again. We're going to retread that path from, from, north, from south to north, this time thinking about some of the instruments that were involved with scientific or natural philosophical investigation. And here we find a very close relationship between the practical arts of navigation and astronomy. So again, those ships that went out to the New World needed to have reliable methods of navigation, and those were based upon the stars. Here you see a simple quadrant in use to tell you what your angle is to known stars in the sky, and hence what your latitude is. And here you see a much larger and grander, but essentially similar device that begins to be used by astronomers who are looking at the stars for their own sake. As a result of these tools and instruments, we start to see maps like this emerging. So notice how different that is from Ptolemy's map. And here we have the sea crisscrossed by these lines that are connected to places for seeing and measuring the stars. And there would also be tables that would tell you what you could measure and where that would tell you that you were. And so maps like this began to emerge, maps which are a good deal closer to the shapes that we know today, although not entirely perfect. The problem of longitude, I expect you know about this, was a particular problem. It's quite easy to know what latitude you are on the Earth. All you have to do is wait for a sunny day, and by measuring the angle of the sun at, the high, at its highest point, at, at your local noon, and then by comparing that to a chart, you can easily calculate where, where you are, how far north or south you are. To figure out how far around the world you are is much harder. A circle is 360 degrees, divide that by 24 hours, that's 15 degrees. If your local noon is one hour different from the noon where you set out, you know you've traveled 15 degrees round. But the problem was there were no clocks that were accurate enough, reliable enough to keep time over a long sea voyage that might last even for years. So this was a great race. It was a great scientific and technological race between different European nations. And because it mattered so much, if you found some wonderful island with loads of valuable wealth that you could take, there was no point going back home and describing it unless you could reliably find it again for a second time. And similarly, there might be dangerous rocks or reefs where your ship could run aground. But if you knew your grid reference, your longitude and your latitude, you could reliably avoid it thereafter. So there was a big race amongst European nations. Eventually, John Harrison created the chronometer in uh, Great Britain that uh, was, for a good while, the preferred solution. Now, this is, a, I think, a 19th century painting of Galileo looking through his telescope. And these are some of his famous moon drawings that he produced, and more of those in a minute. Galileo took what was, again, a navigational instrument, a military instrument, and turned it to the stars. So do you remember I told you to notice how Venice was almost entirely made of coast. In Venice, the telescope was used to check where the ships that were approaching were ships just coming to trade or whether they were enemy ships coming to attack. And that was what the telescope was used for. It was used for those military purposes. But Galileo turned that telescope to the skies, just as the sextants uh, and other navigational instruments had been turned to astronomical use. But not everyone accepted this. Galileo had a patron, someone who provided him with money and supported his research, who was called um, Della Porta. And Della Porta said, I have seen the secret use of the eyeglass, and it's, and then he said a rude word, in Italian. Does anybody speak Italian? No, so I can say it in Italian. Coglione. 
And if you want to know what that means, you have to look it up. Um, why, why was Della Porta so dismissive of this? Well, I think it's because it was such a new use for the telescope. If you were used to going back to Aristotle to find out the meaning of the universe, the structure of the universe, it was a bit odd that you would use this tube that was used to see what ships were coming, that you would claim this was a way of finding out about the universe. It was just really a, just a mismatch, really, of, of technique and purpose. But Galileo, nothing daunted, gathered some people who were a little bit more open-minded, and they spent the night looking at the heavens through this telescope. And then, just to try and prove to them that what they had seen was real and not some kind of artifact of the lens, as dawn rose, he trained his telescope on this church here to read, which was some way distant, to read the engravings that were on the wall. Engravings that couldn't be read by eye from that distance, but could be seen by the telescope. But even that wouldn't be enough to persuade Della Porta, because for Della Porta, following that Aristotelian tradition, there's just something different about the outer sphere. It's just not, it's just not the same kind of stuff as the sublunar sphere. There's just no reason to believe that your human tools would be able to tell you about that. And moreover, what Galileo was claiming to find about these far distant spheres challenged everything in Aristotelian philosophy. It cha challenged Aristotle's metaphysics, the properties that he ascribed to the universe. You remember I said that everything out in space was supposed to be perfect, but here was a pockmarked moon. Here were sunspots. Here were new heavenly bodies, the moons of Jupiter. So the problem was that once you started to pick it, pick at it, the whole of Aristotelian philosophy might fall. It was a big and scary possibility. So the question was, how much could you rely on things like microscopes, on these tools that were taken from various everyday uses, how much could you rely on your senses to find out about nature? How much could you trust the power of the eye over the power of the ancient text? And one person to write extensively about that was the British natural philosopher, Francis Bacon. And this is what he said about his own researches. Now, my method, though hard to practice, is easy to explain, and it is this. I propose to establish progressive stages of certainty. So, drawn from humanism, we have that idea that you can have a tentative certainty to begin with. But now see how he gets that later certainty. The evidence of the sense, helped and guarded by a certain process of correction, I retain. But the mental operation which follows the act of sense, I for the most part reject, philosophizing. I reject that. And instead of it, I open and lay out a new and certain path for the mind to proceed in, starting directly from the simple, sensuous perception. The senses, most particularly the power of the eyes. And Philosophers today, we call that empiricism, a way of finding out that is based on the senses. But as a historian, it pays to be a little bit cautious um, about this. For one thing, Francis Bacon was just one among many, and he's come to have perhaps an undue historic prominence because he was chosen by the founders of the Royal Society of London as their inspirational figure. They said, what we're doing is going to be like Francis Bacon. So they selected him from all the other investigators at the time and said, this is what we're doing. So perhaps we're looking through someone else's selection when we see that. Also, and here's, here's really pause of thought, the word empiricism didn't even exist in that period. There was no word 
for the philosophical method of finding out through your senses. So that ought to give us pause for thought. If there was no word for it, perhaps it wasn't as clearly articulated a concept as we might think. And finally, we should notice that much as perhaps some of the ancient philosophy is taking a bit of a bashing during this period, religion remained central to scientific practice. Many, many of the great figures of early modern science were profoundly religious men. Going on with our instruments and continuing with the Royal Society of London, we can think about Robert Hooke. If you flip a microscope or a telescope around, you get a microscope. And Hooke saw marvels through his microscope, marvels that were not stitched together but were just there in nature waiting to be discovered if you could but use the right tools. And this is rightly, I think, the most famous illustration from the book that he created, Micrographia. Very, very big book. Big, big illustrations of things that had hitherto been too tiny to see. And this picture always gives me a little bit of a shiver, not just because it's a flea, but because it's a flea at the time of the Great Plague in Great Britain. So for all we know, Hook had a lucky escape that he put that one under the microscope rather than let it go hopping through his clothes. Robert Hook and his friends were giving another challenge to Aristotelian metaphysics. So Galileo had challenged it out there in the heavens, but now Hook and his contemporaries were challenging the idea that there were four elements. But instead of going to 118, or however many we have today, they went down from four to one. This is Robert Boyle of Boyle's Law. I have often suspected that there may be in the air some latent qualities or powers due to the substantial parts or ingredients whereof it consists. Though they all agree in constituting by their minuteness and various motions one great mass of fluid matter, yet perhaps there is scarcely a more heterogeneous body in the world. Perhaps a little bit hard to follow on first hearing. This is the machine he used called the air pump. It was a method for making vacuums and for also for trying to squish air together. And when you squish air together, it wants to boing outwards. And this is what he means that perhaps in the air there are lots of tiny springs or tiny particles so that although air looks like just one mass of fluid matter, perhaps there are all these tiny little things in it. And this, uh, this was called corpuscularianism, the idea that everything is made of just small particles and everything that we can measure or observe about a body, its colour, its heat, its motion, is just the effect of the interaction of these single homogeneous little particles. So from four elements to one. And it was also perhaps a more modest metaphysics than the Christianized version of Aristotelianism. The naturalist, said Boyle, has recourse to the first cause, but for its general and ordinary support and influence, whereby it preserves matter and motion from annihilation. And in, and in explicating particular phenomena, the naturalist considers only the size, shape, motion, or want of it, texture, and the resulting qualities and attributes of the small particles of matter. So by the first cause is meant the question of God and the creation of all of this. He's saying that the naturalist or natural philosopher in his work will draw no conclusions about how God made this or what purpose he intended it for. God only explains, essentially, why there is something and not nothing. And that in itself is a mystery that he sets to one side. He says, we're not going to deal with that. We're only going to look at what I just described, the size, shape, motion of these little things that make up every material that we have around us. And so that modesty in a metaphysics, that active decision to set religious questions on one side, albeit the practitioners 
were pious in their everyday life. That was, again, something that was new about natural philosophy in this period. It set aside the why questions and concentrated on the how and what questions. And to understand why this was accepted as a good way to go, we need to think about the nature of the institutions of science, about the groups of people who got together to talk about science, about the values which they shared and why they encouraged and permitted certain kinds of investigation, the size, the shape, the motion, and why they decided that they were going to set aside everything else that they had inherited from medieval periods. So once again, we're going to retread that journey from southern to northern European countries, looking at the institutions of science. So we could start with the Academy of Lynxes, as it was known. This was an organization, a society, and a loose association of men who were interested in natural philosophy, including Galileo, and under the patronage of our old friend, Della Porta, the man who said the rude thing about telescopes. And these people got together and they were interested in using the power of the eyes to look at nature. But it was pretty informal. Della Porta was interested in what they had to say, but it didn't go much further than that. If we turn to the French Academy of Science, which was founded in 1666, so that's a couple of generations later, we find science serving a very different purpose. Just look at this picture, just look at the grandeur of this vision. And the more attention you pay to this picture, the more detail that you see. You see here a beautiful platonic solid that reminds us of, of Kepler. You see these astronomical instruments, navigational instruments, uh, you see some kind of pulley system going on there. You see some kind of parabola there, uh, some geometry there, a globe, a huge globe in the center there. Extraordinary, all these different devices and the grandeur of the vision that they embody. And they tell us something about how the academy functioned in France. It was under the king and it was supposed to benefit the nation of France. It was supposed to bring glory and honor to the king, to enhance his kingdom by bringing it more material wealth and bringing it wisdom and knowledge beyond the rest of the world. That was how highly Louis rated his scientists. Now, embarrassing moment for the British, lock up your ears, British Council. King Charles II called his Royal Society, my fools. That was what he thought of them. He said they were my, my fools. And I suppose the question is, why did they bother asking him to be their patron if that was his attitude to research? Well, the problem was they had to because England, as it was then, had just come out of a civil war. King Charles's father, King Charles I, had lost his head as a result of this. And then there'd been a period of interregnum of parliamentary rule and lots of fighting. And finally, King Charles II was re-established on the throne. And he put in place a crackdown because he didn't want the same thing to happen again. So it was forbidden for a group of men over a certain size to meet in private because who knows what plans they might be cooking up. It was forbidden to correspond with people elsewhere in Europe, because who knew what alliances you might be cooking up, inviting people perhaps to come over and fight. But these men wanted, people like Hook and Boyle, wanted to get together and talk about natural philosophy. So they had to go to the king and say, look, we just want to make Boigny air machines. We promise you we're not going to get up to any mischief at all. Will you give us your approval? And so King Charles II said, okay. And so we see King Charles II here being crowned with a laurel wreath in the style of a Roman 
I don't know, a, a Roman VIP, uh, in this history of the Royal Society of London. And again, we see some of those tools used by natural philosophers scattered around this. But it's, it's nowhere near, is it, such a grand vision as that one. It's quite a different thing. This is the history of the Royal Society of London, and it was published only five years after the Royal Society was founded. That's pretty optimistic to think that five years counts as history. And I think that when you read this very, very interesting book, and it's, it's surprisingly readable, even with its 500-year-old English, 400-year-old English, it's a, actually a manifesto dis disguised as a history. This is the book that says Francis Bacon is who we're following. And Spratt has all sorts of interesting things to say about what characterizes their research and what characterizes their discussion and even their modes of writing. So these men, meeting in these difficult circumstances, have to make sure they don't do anything that looks suspicious by political standards. And, and, and think about what it's like to live in a country so full of tensions, where family has been fighting family only a year before, where one sect of Christianity has been pitched against another, where loyalties to the king and to parliament. So you know what it's like, right? When different, different groups have been at war and then they're pushed back together. And it's uneasy, it's uneasy. And so to overcome the uneasiness, they decided that they would avoid all the dangerous topics, anything that might be a flashpoint, religion, politics, big philosophical questions. They said, we will put all of that on one side. All we will do is experiments and demonstrations, like with the air pump, and we will confine ourselves to saying, yes, we saw this, or no, we didn't. And we won't get sucked into those big philosophical questions that can end in arguments at best, bloodshed at worst. And so, as historians like Steve Shapin and Simon Schaffer have argued, this birth of something like the, science, the, the experimental method in science was actually the solution to a social problem. They just agreed that the word of gentlemen concerning what they saw would constitute the whole of their knowledge. And this is from a book in the same period, it's called The Unreasonableness of Atheism. And it includes really a very nice summary of what the Royal Society were about. When very many together agree to the fact of a thing they saw, it must needs give all the cumulative advantage to the certainty of it that we can possibly expect. So you've got these experiments happening in the room and you've got the men agreeing, yes, this is what we saw. I give my word as a gentleman, this is what I saw and we will agree that that is reliable knowledge. And not only that, the, pr the problem is, I'll just leave the words off the screen for a minute. The problem is that you can only fit so many people in a room and there are people all around Europe who would like to know what happened in that room. How, how do we know? So writing was the thing, the printing press had recently been invented, writing was the thing that could potentially establish this knowledge beyond the room in which it was demonstrated. And there was a great deal of thought about what that writing should be like. And here's where Thomas Spratt is actually very interesting. He spends a lot of time talking about what scientific writing should be like. And this is, he characterized it in a series of oppositional pairs. He said, first of all, that it should be masculine and not feminine. He said that it should be bourgeois and not aristocratic. Aristocrats are very flowery, use quotations in foreign languages. It should be bourgeois, good, honest trading stuff. And last of all, and most importantly of all, it should be English and not French. French is the worst way of writing. So very, very, very interesting to read. Robert Boyle, of air pump fame, wrote many, many books, and he thought very deeply about how you could communicate what you saw in a way that created reliable knowledge. He wanted to make it as though 
when you read the account, it was as though you had been in the room yourself. And this is a little fragment of what he had to say about it. So he's been talking about how bad writing is when the author tells you their opinions and you might sort of follow them in their opinions and get into all kinds of trouble. But if a writer endeavors by delivering new and real observations or experiments to credit his opinions, the case is much otherwise. It's, it's otherwise than this kind of crazy following a will-o'-the-wisp. For let his opinions be never so false, his experiments being true, I am not obliged to believe the former, I'm not obliged to believe his opinions, and left at liberty to benefit myself by the latter. I can benefit myself by knowing what his observations were, and I can set his opinions on one side if those are a bit crazy. And so this became a standard for scientific writing. You had to be sure that you could understand what the person had saw. You had to be sure that the person was a gentleman of good honor and was not lying about what he saw. And you had to be sure that the book had been printed in a way that accurately reflected those matters and that the book had not been credited to somebody else or the experiments had not been credited to somebody else, that the book was not making them up. Because the world of books was like the world of the internet today. You could never tell what had been copied and pasted. You could never tell whether something could be imputed to the person that it was imputed to. The world of piracy in books was a very flourishing thing. Books were always being ripped off, published, republished, made more um, provocative than they were intended to be. Because this was still a great time of political and religious tension around Europe. And then as now, controversy sold extremely well. So publishers would kind of grab something by some natural philosopher and give it a bit of a twist, make it say something really outrageous, and publish it. So it wasn't just the writing style that needed to be accurate. You needed to know that you could trace these written observations right back to their source. And here comes, I think, one of the really unsung heroes in the history of science. And probably rather few of you have heard of him. He's called Henry Oldenburg. And he was the secretary of the Royal Society for a very long time. And he saw the problem of piracy. He saw the problem of controlling what was reported about what happened in the royal institution. And he worked tirelessly to make sure that what was published accurately reflected what had happened. And he was like a bulldog in chasing down these naughty pirated editions and, and really trying to establish a reliable communicational channel for this new experimental science that was being pursued. And in the course of that, he inaugurated the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, giving some account of the present undertakings, studies and labors of the ingenious in many considerable parts of the world. I think we should retitle scientists the ingenious. That's great, isn't it? Um, and so this is considered the first scientific journal. It celebrated its 350th anniversary last year. And I think it's easy to forget how essential reliable communication is to the production of scientific knowledge. It's not knowledge unless it's been communicated. If it's just happening in that room, a bunch of guys looking at the air pump, it's not knowledge, it's a secret. So in summary, um, I think there are at least three types of thing going on. We, I told you about the themes, but sort of three types of thing going on in this story about how modern science got started. There were, as we finished by saying, new ways of seeing the world, this sense-based experimental method. But as we saw, in the history of the Royal Society, those were created in the context of new social and political arrangements. The word of a gentleman in a tense and difficult world. And also, material culture played an important part. The invention of new devices, the reuse of devices which were already in place, and 
the economic world of the items that were being bought, traded, um, and discovered in the new world. And so thinking about those three themes, I think, invites us to look at the future and think about how we might go on, bearing in mind those dimensions of our scientific research to decide how science is going to build the future. Thank you so much for your attention. Dr. Slay, you weren't joking when you said it's a whistle stop. No. <laughs> um, any questions for Dr. Slay? Yeah. Firstly, thank you very much for the very informative and riveting presentation. I have just a couple of questions. First, concerning the issue of religion of faith. Uh, in, in this uh, scientific world. Now, the science of the Renaissance period, was it driven by um, the spirit of inquiry to unravel the secrets of universe, but the God element was always omnipresent. It wasn't sort of studying nature in a very sterile, secular fashion. Is that something which you agree? My, um, second question is, you had mentioned uh, about these explorers going to different parts of the world, bringing in different artifacts, like raiding the different countries. Now, if I understand right, this was before the onset of an imperial agenda. So were these just naive, uh, curious, inquisitive explorers, or were the patronage dictated by understanding the lands for conquest? Thank you. Great. Okay, so two really... Uh, really intelligent questions there, each of which would take a whole lecture to answer properly. So, um, the, so the first one is about the role of theology in inspiring those investigations. Don't fill in your form now because I'm answering your question. Hold it till later. Um, and, and yes, I, I, I simplified a bit. I think, uh, I think for some people, there was pretty much a, a divorce between those, and, and as Boyle's statement suggested, they, you know, perhaps they went to church, did the formalities of religion, maybe even were genuinely pious, but that was just in a different mental box from their investigations. And you get the sense of that with some people, like, for example, Robert Hooke uh, would be an example of that. For others, the driving force was actually very much uh, a religious, a theological quest. And actually, probably the best example of that would be Isaac Newton himself, who um, had all kinds of, from our perspective, some quite strange um, religious ideas, quite out of kilter with mainstream Christianity. And, and he was trying, I think he was trying to make sense of God by, by making sense of the universe in, in some ways. Um, and, and, and even Boyle himself, although he, he said that we're setting this to one side, but he, he practiced what today we, we call natural theology. He wrote lots and lots of essays, short little essays. They'd be, they'd be blogs today. He'd, be, he'd have been a blogger if he could have been. Very short little essays about things that you can observe in nature and the reflections that those yield about the nature of God and your relationship with him. So I think it was, a, it was a real variety. I think as today, you know, there are, there are some people who are just very pragmatic and they get on with what they do and they're just not really bothered by those kinds of questions. And then there are other people who they, they can't stop thinking about the big questions about the meaning of life. So I think it was a bit of a, a, bit of a variety, really. Your second question was about imperialism and the nature of the patronage that sponsored this material grab and the knowledge gathering, the, the knowledge aspects that came from it. That's also a great question. Um, and as I began the lecture by saying, Europe was a much more fragmented place than it is today, I, I suppose because um, patterns of transport and communication were 
were, were much weaker than they are now. It was harder to maintain control over a large empire. Although even as I say that, I'm thinking Mongols, Romans, so maybe scratch that. But anyway, um, it was it was much uh, the states were much smaller. So what looks to us today like quite small scale patronage was actually still about significant consolidation of local power. Um, so but perhaps thinking in the categories of state is, is, is not quite the right categories for that period. Um, so I guess that, that's my answer to, to that question. But really interesting things started to happen in the 19th century, which is when the modern nation states have, uh, that we have today were really consolidated in Europe. And at that point, they did begin to sponsor scientific inquiry, knowledge consolidation in more precise ways. And I'm thinking, um, especially of the British, who established observatories around the world, many, many in India, but you know, Singapore, the Malay archipelago, everywhere. These observatories that observe not just the stars, but meteorological conditions, geological phenomena. And as the British Empire kind of asserted itself, they were asserting uh, a system of knowledge that was as globalized as, as, as the empire itself was. So there's a very kind of, I mean, I think most of us are guilty of wanting to divide history into goodies and baddies. And one of the problems with the history of science is that so much that's great about science has been put in place established through very horrible human events. Another great example of that is the data that we have about climate change. The reason we have such good data is because of the Cold War. So it was the, the Americans and the British and, and various other people who were worried about vibrations that might tell you there was a Soviet submarine coming or uh, various physical conditions. And that's why they started measuring temperatures and ice cores and all these things in Antarctica and places where you think, why would you, why would you be interested? And that's, that has yielded for us today a, a very rich data set that we can use. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a complex history. So this continues some of the themes uh -huh. of your answer. Um, so the idea that there's such a geographical, cultural dimension to science at that time, and in some sense a lot of competition between different uh, modes of gaining knowledge, but today science there's sort of a bland uniformity to the, the way we do science, if not the things that we study. Um, so does that take something away from the power of what we're able to discover? Oh, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Yes. The uh, science is the, the McDonald's of knowledge. It's globalized. It's the same everywhere. That would be a great book title, wouldn't it? Um, do we lack something as a result? Well, there are elements of that that we need to be true, that we need to be the case. And again, many of these things were put in place in the 19th century. We need to know a meter is a meter is a meter. That one Celsius is one Celsius is one Celsius because we can't get on with anything unless we can be sure of those certainties and that they hold true and are agreed around the world. Um, You could certainly argue that perhaps the subculture or superculture that scientists have constructed for themselves around the world perhaps means that they miss out on indigenous knowledge that they could make use of. That they, they go, for example, to sort of experimental molecular constructions and see whether those work rather than going and finding cures that people use around the world. I was reading a great story about that in the newspaper, the story, I'm not, this morning. I'm not sure how reliable it was, but um, supposedly this research in America has found some substance that's 
may have a benefit in Alzheimer's, um, which was discovered by hearing about these folk remedies. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but there are examples like that. Um, and examples, other examples of that ilk would be the temptation to impose mega technological solutions for to compensate for environmental change, where perhaps you could listen more to local communities and find lower tech solutions that kind of flex more with their natural cultural patterns or what have you. Um, it is, that's a, it, it's such an interesting question to think about, isn't it, in relation to the science practiced in rapidly developing countries like India um, and whether they can play the same game as the McDonald's of science or whether they should play the same game. So I think there's a lot of discussion in India at the moment about how to make sure that various metrics of science are the same as metrics for Western science, that the metrics of citation and impact factor should, should reach certain levels. And one might question whether there are other ways to think about what counts as good science or the science that we want. I'm not exactly sure what those would be, but it's worth asking the question. And I suppose finally, thinking about that journal example, a meter is a meter is a meter. But as I said, there's a, there's a human dimension to the making of communication that is part of making knowledge. And perhaps there is sometimes too much faith that the, the system of journals is the equivalent of a meter that it is you know, almost a scientific instrument in itself for making knowledge, forgetting that journals are edited by human beings embedded within institutions, drawing on pools of referees that they know and trust and are comfortable with, and that there are human elements to, to that system which may be fallible and, and which may perpetuate certain inequalities uh, or certain asymmetries um, within within the scientific world. I've forgotten what your question was. I've talked for so long, but but hopefully some of those were, were relevant things to say. Uh -huh. how they kind of establish a, a journal and whether they copy the, the, the ex, uh, experiences of the philosophy transactions or whether they have a different way to kind of set down their standards or maybe it took even longer. So how, how kind of like is this transfer? Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing to say is that one should not underestimate how fluid communication was in early modern Europe and that the, um, the, the exchange of letters and also printed material was, was very full and surprisingly rapid. So that's the first thing to say. It's not that these countries were operating in isolation. We, we sort of think now, oh, now we've got the internet, but in the old days, everything went at the pace of a donkey and it was, you know, it was more connected than you might realize. I cannot answer your question, but there, as, as you might imagine, in response to this 350th anniversary, there has been a big historic project that's been going on about the philosophical transactions, about this establishment and its, its early history. And as a part of that, they have had conferences that have compared international examples. So if you track down that project, I can give you the name at the end if you like, you will certainly find the, the names of historians who will be able to answer that question for you. Thank you so much, Dr. Flynn, for this great talk. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thanks very much.